Seeking mental health care can be overwhelming and even scary, but it doesn't have to be. I'm Dr. Josephine McNary, and I'm committed to making this process easier for you. Each week, my expert guest and I unravel a different form of therapeutic intervention in order to bring comfort and understanding and to help you get back to your true self. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Mind Stories. Today, I'm pleased to have on as our guests, Dr. Susan Hamuda and Dr. Kelly Beck. Today, we talk about the psychological impacts of infertility and infertility treatments. Dr. Humuda is a clinical psychologist practicing in Los Angeles with a primary focus on trauma and mood disorders, which surround infertility and miscarriage, pregnancy, and life postpartum. While infertility, pregnancy, and postpartum are her primary specialties, she continues to work with individuals who experience other traumas and emotional struggles. Dr. Kelly Beck is a board-certified reproductive endocrinologist practicing in Los Angeles. She began her education at the Marlboro School in Los Angeles. She then traveled east and graduated with honors from John Hopkins University. She earned her medical degree from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City and completed her residency in OB-GYN at the NYU Medical Center. She completed her postdoctoral fellowship training in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at the Weill Cornell Medical Center, the Center for Reproductive Medicine and Infertility. Welcome, Drs. Hamuda and Beck. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Mind Stories. Today, I'm pleased to have on as our guests two special guests. One is Dr. Susan Hamuda, who is a psychologist practicing in Los Angeles, specializing in reproductive women's mental health with an emphasis on infertility, and Dr. Kelly Beck, who is a reproductive endocrinologist. Welcome. Thank Thank you. you so much for having us. So I think I've been wanting to talk about this topic for a very long time because I think it's a topic that doesn't, isn't talked about that often and I think deserves a bit of attention. And that is kind of the, the psychological impact of infertility and infertility treatments. Absolutely. I'm so happy that you reached out to me and wanted to talk about this because it, it really doesn't get enough attention, the psychological impact and the emotional turmoil that individuals and couples go through trying to conceive. So I'm very excited to finally yeah. talk about this in a public forum. Yeah. And there are not that many specialists who specialize in that. And, um, and I know Dr. Beck, I mean, I think you see this all the time, a, t- a ton of distress, of course, around this traumatic kind of experience. Right. No, I also think it's great that you're having this conversation because I don't think people talk about it enough. And I think there's this like false sense that everyone feels that if they're on anti, any antidepressants or any um, anti-anxiety medications that they have to wean off of it a hundred percent before they start to conceive. And that's really not the case. So there's this misconception out there that they have to wean off a hundred percent. And then it makes it a little bit more difficult when they're going through the treatment cycle. So I really try to help start the conversation, make sure that patients feel supported and send them to people who, you know, when they need help. And I actually refer a lot to Dr. Hamude. So it's like really nice to have that support group and having a network, but also to have people who kind of will tell you, here are the facts, here's the data that tells you it's safe to take these antidepressants, right? Anti-anxiety medications at this level. And you don't have to take it, uh, stop things cold turkey, because we do know that when these things are not well addressed, postpartum, they're, they're at a higher risk of developing postpartum depression. So I think that, you know, it's already challenging enough to go through fertility treatments and evaluations. So whatever we can do to help um, support them during the entire process, I think is really important. Do you agree, Susan? Absolutely. There's such a stigma around infertility and having to go through either IUI or IVF or surrogacy. Um, so I, a lot of my clients feel very isolated and feel very alone. And it's just so common to struggle to conceive and without having more open conversations about it, it just reinforces the the shame that these clients already feel. So I am, again, I'm I'm just so happy that we can have a very honest and open conversation about it and let clients know like you're not alone. It's very common and support is available. And and I, I also refer clients to Dr. Beck and um, Dr. Beck is so special in a way that she takes a holistic approach to treatment, which I love. So without, without the emphasis on focusing on your emotional health, getting through a cycle of IVF or IUI or going through surrogacy is really, really challenging. And so I'm, I'm so glad that Dr. Beck has a co- this comprehensive model that she uses with her patients. So I don't, I'm sure Josephine, you probably see this as well, but like when we, when I talk about mental health or trying to help support patients, it's not just 
to get through the treatment and to get you pregnant. But it's also, it helps with relationships because people's relationships are really affected not only with their partners, but their friends and family. I mean, do you see that a lot, Josephine? Yes, all the time. And I actually am very happy that you brought up kind of the idea about women wanting to go off medication and Mm -hmm. that always risks destabilization in so many different aspects of their life. Mm -hmm. Um, But yes, I mean, it's all encompassing, right? The stress surrounding infertility and then the shame and secrecy around that, I feel like only serves to kind of make these symptoms even worse in terms of the discomfort and stress around it. Dr. Beck, I think one question I have for you is, you know, you're kind of in the front line seeing these patients, seeing these people come in, worrying about infertility, kind of thinking about the treatments and kind of moving forward what they're going to do. At what point do you think you kind of, at what point do you think about maybe referring to Susan for added support? At what point, what is that line? And I know it's kind of a very broad question, but at what point do you think is kind of, what is normal versus not normal? And I, maybe that's an unfair question. (laughs) Um, but where do, how do you think about that? Yeah, so actually, it's at my initial consult. So for everyone, uh, the initial consultation is something that I kind of bring up. And if you bring it up with everyone, it takes the stigma away from it. This is like normal. Everyone's going through it. In the same way, I talk about acupuncture for people, acupuncture in the right hands. And it's not just doing acupuncture. I talk about sleep and how sleep and stress actually disrupts ovulation. So people always think, oh, I'm getting eight hours of sleep. That's all that matters. Well, it's not how many hours of sleep? Is it restful sleep? What time are you going to bed? The pulsatility of our pituitary occurs at night. So people who work late at night or are on their phones late at night, you know, it makes a difference. In the same way for stress, it's like when you have an exam or you're buying a house or you're moving, people's menstrual cycles could be off. So I kind of um, give those examples, which, you know, have no stigma whatsoever. And if you have that support, I think once you start the conversation, even if no one will acknowledge it at that initial visit, I, um, what I tend to find is that the subsequent visits at ultrasounds, people will say, you, do you remember when you said that? Do you have someone that you recommend? So I really have it as an open-ended question. I will bring up the um, idea of support and I really try to create a team around each patient, whether it's with an acupuncturist, mind, body specialist, you know, we try to really see the patient as from holistic with the WHOL, you know, because I really want to make sure we're addressing all the different concerns to optimize your cycle. The biggest mistake I see is when people rush patients through cycles without trying to say, okay, how can we make this better? How do we increase ovarian activity? And when you address the stress, we talk about meditation. I always tell people, I trained in New York. I was there for 20 years. I'm not hippy dippy, but it makes a difference. And I think just having that validation from a doctor helps people take that step back and say, okay, I really want to get help. I want to like work on this before I do it. And so we also talk about, um, healthy ways to address it, whether it's um, exercise and sleep and meditation. But with exercise, um, sometimes a lot of women try to get this high intensity workouts that they really feel is going to help them, you know, get the stress out. But the problem with that is it affects their varying activity sometimes. So we talk about avoiding high intensity workouts and trying to find other ways. And I really do bring up, I offer um, referrals to like Dr. Mune pretty early on. And it's at the initial consult. And then if um, someone brings it up again, but certainly if someone looks like they're struggling at any visit, I will bring it up each time. Right. And it almost seems, I mean, it's almost to your advantage and their advantage. If you can maximize their mental health and decrease the amount of stress, the, the outcomes are going to be better. Absolutely. Right. Right. Susan, do you find, what do you find is the most challenging when you first meet the patients um, when they're going to fertility? It's probably the hopelessness, right? And the discouragement. Um, and so what I try to do is create a space where we can process their reproductive narrative, right? One that's been developed early in childhood and help them process the loss. It's usually like, that's usually the core of therapy when working with infertility clients and those who experience pregnancy loss or are unable to get pregnant every time they get their period or every time there's a failed cycle, there's this loss, the loss of the the idea of this child that they've been dreaming of. Um, so the hopelessness tends to be the most the most challenging part. And I try to instill hope, not that I can guarantee that they will have a baby, but hope that that they can move forward with their lives and cope with this grief. And there are no rules to the coping; it's on their own timeline. Um, but just hope that that life moves on and. For them to be able to to see other outcomes for themselves, whether it's to try again with another cycle, whether it's to explore another option like surrogacy or adoption, 
Um, but processing the grief is usually the, the central theme of my sessions with clients who are going through infertility. It's a huge component and it doesn't get talked about. And again, there's a lot of shame, especially if someone experiences a miscarriage, let's say, you know, early on the first trimester, there's a lot of minimization of it of like, well, like, well, at least I wasn't at, you know, X amount, at least I wasn't in my second trimester or third trimester. Um, but we forget that there's an attachment to this idea of a child way before even getting pregnant. And so I think it's so critical to acknowledge that for clients. And that acknowledgement provides them such a sense of relief that it's okay, that it's okay to feel this sense of devastation. It's okay to grieve, even if you didn't have a baby. Yeah, no, I agree hundred percent. And you know who else? Sometimes I find that it really needs a lot of support or women who decide to be a single mom by choice or decide to do egg freezing because you think, well, it's egg freezing. You're just um, preserving your fertility. Well, some women do egg freezing because they're in their twenties or thirties and they are going to like delay having children because they're going to grad school or starting a job. But for other women, they come to a point where when they have a realization that maybe I'm not sure if I'm going to find someone or a life partner. And so that's really a hard time for women um, to figure out you know, this isn't really what I planned on. I thought I'd be, you know, have a life partner. I thought I'd have children by now. And to just kind of process through that and, you know, just to kind of rewrite like what your next steps are. But I also really try my best to have a focus, not just on fertility. Cause I think whenever every focus and conversation is just purely on fertility, it just makes it so much bigger. I always tell women, you're not walking on eggshells. You can do everything perfectly. You can, eat Pil- you can do Pilates every day. You can eat organic and live this perfect life. And still it could be challenging and we may not be successful. So you have to feel that like a certain part is up to nature. We can do our best. But I think taking that pressure off of them, because when you feel that you have control over this, um, that's what causes so much pressure. Do you see that, Josephine? Like, I'm sure you both must see that a lot. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, because there's such a sense of, of lack of control when you're trying to conceive and there's this huge clock in front of you and you're always waiting. It's just a waiting game. When am I ovulating, right? And now I have to wait to see like, did, it, did the cycle work or like, am, am I able to conceive? And it's um, it's all, the anxiety is just so all encompassing. Yeah. And Susan, I love how you brought up kind of this idea of the grief of a loss of how you expected your reproductive story to go, Right. right. And I think with anything in life, but this is a huge thing in, in a woman's in a woman's life in terms of how they imagine like what the story will be for them and to have to be able to let go of, you know, it's not going to be exactly the way I expected it to be. Um, and this idea of, you know, maybe, you know, the path is just, you know, it's so different for different women, right? Um, the one thing actually I wanted to bring up, and I was thinking about it because you think about individual therapy for infertility, kind of women going through infertility and trauma and loss of miscarriage and things like that. I have mixed feelings about groups in terms of support mm-hmm. groups because a lot of women say, you know, you know, they compare themselves to other women. Other women have these successes and they don't, and they feel guilt that they feel a certain way towards that experience with that dynamic with that person. I mean, what if, what are your thoughts about groups? I feel the same way. I have mixed feelings and I've gone back and forth a lot on it. Um, I think that community is wonderful to be able to share your stories, to resonate with others, to know you're not alone, but it's tricky if some of those clients are trying to conceive, right? And you're right. And one is able to, and one is, one's going through a miscarriage and the comparison. And if it is, for example, um, a group that's focused on, on pregnancy loss, depending on the trimester, right? Women, again, they tend to compare themselves like, well, I shouldn't feel so bad because I lost, I lost this pregnancy early on compared to this, this other individual. Um, so I think it's really challenging. So I do, I do individual work and which also allows for a lot more intimacy and processing grief because grief is so different for everybody. Um, yeah. And, but I, but I understand it's been very conflicting and I haven't run one yet because of, of those concerns of, right. What do you do when one client is pregnant and the other is unable to get pregnant? And granted, it can allow for the process of that, um, but it could also not feel very safe for some clients. Yeah. Um, for myself, uh, you know, obviously because of HIPAA compliance, we do everything individually. We don't do groups, but um, I do find that sometimes, you know, when patients become friends because they see each other in the um, waiting area, that it, it is challenging when having a support network is great, 
but it really should be people with people who aren't trying to freeze eggs at the same time as you are or trying to have a baby because it does cause um, a slight fracture at times when one person conceives and the other doesn't. And it's harder when the older person conceives and the younger person doesn't. And I try to remind people we're all here for a different reason. We all have a different, um, you know, history and like, you know, issue with fertility. So that's one of the things. And also with egg freezing, many times it's this is pre-COVID, obviously, but a lot of women, they feel like they're coming to a party. So they, I used to have groups of women, like four to five, come in at the same time. They all want to freeze their eggs together. And it's always devastating because inevitably one of the group, like one person, one in four, one in five is not a great candidate for egg freezing. So even though they all have the same job, they all went to the same school, they're all the same age, you know, it's really devastating for that one person. And I really see how it affects the relationship. So I really advise against doing that as much as possible. But of course, you know, we try our best to support them. But that's why for us, we don't really do groups. You know, I don't know, Susan and, and Josephine, if you've had better success or you have an idea of how that could evolve and we can support each other more. Do you think it's important to do more groups? I think it's really hard, um, especially with trauma. And I've done trauma work for a long time. Um, it may not be the safest setting to ex- talk about your story um, because you may be triggered by someone else's discussion of their trauma, right? Um, and it's, again, it's a big reason why I, I don't do group work and I just do individual work. And again, the community is great. And I think that that's available via social media, which uh, there are pros and cons to that as well. Um, but I think in a therapeutic sense, um, it gets really difficult to navigate. So I stick to individual work. But I think that also speaks to the loneliness that someone experiences. Yeah. So they, they want to reach out to their network, but at the same time, there's a little bit of a danger associated with that and comparing yourself, but then you feel more alone. And it's, there's just not a good answer, really. Right. You're absolutely right. There, there isn't a good answer. Right. Yeah. And it is a very isolating experience. I think Michelle Obama said it so eloquently of like having a miscarriage is so, it's so isolating. It's so lonely. And, but again, the, the discussion of other people's stories could be re-traumatizing for somebody, depending on where they're at in their process. I mean, the other thing I wanted to ask Kelly, you, I think, and you Susan too, but I'm wondering Kelly first about your experience working with couples, because I almost think of you as a therapist, you're a, you're a physician, <laughs> you're also a couples therapist, an individual therapist. I mean, you serve all these roles, right? right? And so, I mean, I'm just curious about kind of, it's such a bigger question, but kind of comment about couples and the relationship through this process. Right. And so even for couples, I'm going to tell you, I've seen it with every single permutation. So when I have two women who come in, you know, two women And, you know, they have this idea that I want to provide the egg, I want to carry. And, you know, this is the idea that they come in with because one is younger, one is older, or one uh, wants to carry and the other has no desire to carry the pregnancy. But to find out that perhaps the person who wants to provide the egg is not the best egg provider. And so that that's always kind of one of those challenging experiences when they realize, wait, (laughs) like this is what I thought. And I always tell people, you're not ordering a sandwich. We really have to figure out you know, our own physiology and figure out like what's the best way. And like, we'll talk about options. And of course, we'll, I'm always help you try to achieve your goals, but we have to do what's medically appropriate. When I have two men together and um, one has great sperm and the other doesn't have great sperm, I know that it's going to compromise their success, even when we use an egg donor. And it's almost like a case control because when you have one egg donor and two different sperm providers, and you fertilize them, you split it 50-50, and one has a ton of blastocysts to work with that are genetically normal, and then one with compromise doesn't have, um, you know, many to work with, or oftentimes none, uh, no normal embryos, like, it's kind of devastating. It does create an issue, because it's, of course, you're, they're in love with each other, but there is a certain, you know, question of competition, where they really felt like, what do you mean, like, we're in the same relationship, and like, we're, the, you know, how is it that you have these normals and I didn't? And did I get like the bad group of eggs? And no, like, so that's one of those things. And then for um, heterosexual couples, what I've been seeing is that, you know, I really try to remove any blame game. Um, oftentimes the focus is always on the woman and believe it or not, 30% of fertility is male factor. And so I really try to even it out. And I tell people, one of the things I really try for every patient is to empower them with information to say, hey, let's figure out what's going on with you. Let's not rush into just trying to do a treatment, figure out what are the potential underlying causes and just like check it off one at a time. And I think when you go through it a little bit more 
um, from a diagnostic point of view, I try to really remove any type of blame. Like this is male factor. This is an egg. It's because she's older. It's because she smoked. And when you kind of give each person a certain degree of responsibility that 50% of the um, embryo is from the egg and 50% is sperm, and there's an equal partnership, that makes a huge difference. The other thing that makes a difference is sometimes having time to intercourse is really hard for couples. So it takes the passion away. And some men just can't perform when they're like, I'm ovulating, let's have sex. And it can't. So I always tell people that's happening. Have sex for fun. We will do an IUI and it takes the pressure off. Susan, a lot of what, what are quick, quick comments about couples and stress on, on this process. Within the- yeah, um, just like Kelly was saying that there's a lot of emphasis on the woman, right? For looking at a heterosexual couple and um, the woman tends to feel as if she's responsible, like my body's failed me, something's wrong with me. Um, and it takes a huge strain on the relationship. I don't see couples. I have a colleague that focuses on, on couples work. And so I refer to her just so there isn't conflict of interest. And so the individual I'm working with who's trying to conceive that, that that space stays safe, but it's a, it's a huge strain on relationships trying to conceive. Yeah. I think the other part is when um, sometimes if the male partner is not taking any ownership of it mm-hmm. and continues to smoke pot or cigarettes or uses hot tubs and goes out and, you know, really doesn't follow the rules of, um, and the female partner is doing everything perfectly, like doing acupuncture, you know, living this clean life it really causes a huge stressor in the relationship because there's this like anger that builds. And so that's really when we try, I try to take a step back and I will sometimes intervene and try to talk to the male partner directly. I mean, it's not always a male partner who is non-compliant, but there's a higher tendency because it's really rare that men assume that there's an issue with their sperm. So if you look out on the internet, you know, there are men who, there is actually a service where you can check your sperm to see if it's normal but it's just, it's not very successful. It's not successful because no man thinks, oh my God, I wonder if my sperm's okay. They just assume that their sperm is okay. Whereas for women, we're always trying to figure out, you know, am I okay? What's my fertility like? And I think women are a lot more proactive. So uh, the main time that I see a problem is when there is, there are issues that we identify for both or, you know, or when there is a male factor and then, and they won't make those um, changes. How do you address well, I, that though in your like counseling session? Like, how do you address that anger and rage that I know my female patients have? Yeah, it gets built up in resentment too, right? Because everything is happening to the individual who's trying to conceive, right? Um, and it takes such a toll. And so I just, I, I offer perspective and I remind my clients that, that, right, that this is a shared partnership, that your body isn't, isn't failing you that, that you're not responsible for this. And that I recommend that I always bring up, like the issue may not be you, right? Okay. Has your partner, has your male partner, like, has he been tested? Has his sperm been tested? Um, and sometimes that's a light bulb that goes off for women of like, Oh, like I never thought about it because right. It, the blame often gets put on the woman, right. It, it, something must be wrong with you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I, well, that, that that anger, I think, is so important to acknowledge and to express in, in a healthy way and to feel, right? Of course, you're angry. You're being blamed for something that you don't have control over. And I may have nothing to do with you. Do you see it too, Josephine, in your practice? I do. I mean, I don't see couples either. Um, I see a lot of women going through the fertility journey. Um, and yes, I mean, I, I've seen kind of stressors with relationships. I actually am thinking about when you're talking about males and kind of wondering, okay, well, has your partner, has your male, has the male been tested? Um, it's interesting. A lot of, um, women are protective of their male partners, Mm. um, feelings about that. Right. And there's a little bit of a hesitancy of a man. It kind of like feels like it's kind of putting into question their manhood, right? It's such a simple thing to be able to test sperm, but there's still a lot of resistance around that. Right. And females feel like a little bit more open to be like, okay, it's probably me. So I, it's interesting. I've noticed female part, ma- with the male partner kind of lagging sometimes to get that testing because they don't really want to know. Right. And what does that mean about their manhood in a way? And so I, I kind of see that too coming out. Right. It's the caretaker aspect of many females, right. To not have, not have their partner hurt, not have their male partner hurt. Right. So if neither of you see the male partners who like, who do ma- men see? Like, I'm sure for men, they must need help too. Cause I definitely, I had actually a male 
um, partner once say that like he feels lost that um, his female partner has all these support groups, has her acupuncturist, has, you know, her therapist. Whereas um, for him, he felt a little bit more lost. Do anyone in your practice, Josephine, see male partners who are going through? Yes. And I, I don't mean to, I'm overgeneralizing, but in general, females tend to seek out more mental health treatment. That's just the reality oh, of it. Really? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I see male and females, but my practice is probably 75% females because they're the people who usually seek care. But I see plenty of males in my group and I've kind of moving on to thinking about fertility treatments. I think about males feeling like, you know, they have such good intentions, but they can't, they, you know, they can't be everything for their partner sometimes. And maybe when they're going through fertility treatments, you know, how to support their, their partner going through these mood shifts and all these things. And so I see that too. Um, and of course they deserve some attention and, um, and care because it is stressful for them. And a lot of times they feel like they, there's no space for their needs either. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, um, the same, most of my practice is, um, practice, like I have female clients, I have a few males. Um, and when I recommend that the partners of my female clients, that their partners seek therapy, there is some resistance. And so women, they do tend to be a little bit more open and willing to go to therapy. Um, but I, I do see some men, but it's predominantly all female. Yeah. Well, being mindful of your time, I, I want to address to some degree before we say goodbye, the, the fertility treatments, mood shifts around fertility treatments. I know that's short lived in terms of thinking about kind of the time that maybe a woman might spend with just kind of thinking about infertility, but maybe a word, Kelly and Susan, just about kind of how to support someone going through fertility treatments and kind of what you see in terms of major shifts in mood sometimes related to that. Sure. When it comes purely from a hormonal point of view um, from fertility treatments, I always try to kind of walk patients through like, what are the different medications that I'm giving you? How can it potentially have an impact on you? And the main ones that we tend to use are the injectable medications, which are FSH or LH. And so that's exactly what your pituitary gives you, but your pituitary only makes, um, uh, sends out enough to make one follicle grow. And here we're teaching you how to do multiple follicles. And you know, once they realize this goes in and out of your system every day, which is why you have to do the shots every day. And you realize that it's your, when your estrogen is rising, it's from your own follicles responding. So I think knowing where the estrogen is coming from makes a huge difference for women because they know they always worry that they're responding to the medication. It's not the medication, but your follicles responding. So it's actually good that you're getting sleepy, that you're getting more emotional. Um, that can happen from the higher estrogen level. But, you know, so I always tell people that's really when you're going to start to feel an estrogen high, you're going to feel very sleepy you're going to feel bloated. And so, you know, that's the type of impact you're going to have after ovulation. Um, you know, a lot of the stressors from after an egg retrieval or after an IUI, because that's after ovulation, when your progesterone level rises, there are progesterone receptors in the brain that can, you know, make you feel a little depressed. And that's where PMDD comes in and people do have these. And so knowing that this can happen, this is, you're releasing more than one egg. Those levels may be higher kind of gives that allowance, like, don't worry, it's not you. This is, you know, common for everyone. This is physiologic, but also just to make, you know, I think as long as you're aware of what could happen, what you're looking for, it actually, I think is much less scarier for women when they experience it. And, but what I try not to do is to negate it or be paternalistic and say, oh, you're just going to be hormonal throughout and you're going to be emotional because that's not true. The majority of my patients are not emotional. They are able to function. They go to work every day throughout their entire cycles and even in pregnancy and they have no problems and they just kind of grit through it. So, but I think just knowing what to expect, it takes a lot of the mystery away. I agree. I think being aware of the mood shifts um, allows them to be very grounded, right? And to use evidence essentially to realize like this is expected. Um, I think one of the challenges in working with infertility clients is like the chronic anxiety. And again, in that clock, right? And the timing of everything. Um, and so I really encourage clients to not focus, and Kelly, you mentioned it's not focused just on, right, the fertility stuff and having a baby and to fill their days up with, with other things. And most of my clients are also high functioning. They know how to cope, right? They know all of, all of this. They just need that reminder. Um, and again, it's really about processing that anxiety and processing that grief. Yeah. 
Yeah. And um, I will say kind of a shout out for maybe use of medication during these periods. One question I have is I see a lot of women with just PMDD symptoms, which is basically pretty significant PMS. You know, they have a history of mood shifts around their cycle. And Kelly, I just, out of my curiosity in terms of what you see, do you find that women who have more of like a PMDD picture, you know, throughout their kind of earlier years, they might have a harder time with hormonal treatment? Absolutely. So I'll, I always tell, ask patients, like, what are your menstrual cycles like? So if you are completely asymptomatic during your cycle, you're probably not going to have that many symptoms. But if you are symptomatic with your menstrual cycles, you are one of those patients who are, you're going to have a higher likelihood that you're going to be symptomatic afterwards. And so I, I agree hundred percent, Josephine, that if you do have PMDD already pre-existing, the likelihood you're going to be more symptomatic is true, but at least to be prepared for it with your therapist, a psychiatrist, and with your medications, because I do not have my patients go cold turkey on any of those medications because I do think it's safe and at certain levels and especially under the care of their own, you know, doctors and therapists. So, you know, I think that's important. And just a clarification for the listeners. So in terms of, you know, there are different methods for evening out moods throughout, especially throughout your cycle. And one method would be the medications called SSRIs, which are actually very helpful for treating PMDD symptoms. And I have plenty of patients who go through fertility treatment who remain on these meds and it actually helps smooth that out a bit more and helps it feel much more tolerable if they remain on their medications to help with any kind of shift in mood throughout kind of hormonal treatment. Is it usually the estrogen crash after ovulation that uh, exacerbates it? So do you give them a little estrogen in the luteal phase? Is that what you do, Josephine? I do. I may, I don't work with Oh. I work with mainly SSRIs and I work with other oh, got it. to do hormonal treatments, but sometimes we give them a little bit of bump up of their medication right before their period, or sometimes they're not on medication and they're only on it right before their period. Um, and then during hormonal treatments, I treat it like a hormonal, a menstrual cycle in a way. And so I say, you know, during this time, why don't we just maybe increase the medication, but they should only do that under the care of a physician who kind of knows what they're doing. In that instance, absolutely. I would never do it on my own. Like I always turn them out for this. But the other thing is, I think whenever um, patients they start, especially if it's the first time, they are always checking their body to feel like, what do I feel? Like, is there anything else I feel differently? Am I feeling bloated? And oftentimes, physiologically, I don't think it's possible because the estrogen level is still low. But you know, I'll always acknowledge it. And kind of when we go do the ultrasounds together and we show them all, this could be where you are. Everyone's different. We're all symptomatic differently and that's okay. But I do think that um, it's great to know that you can actually titrate the medications throughout the cycle. I didn't know that you could do that during a cycle. That's great. Do most, um, do most do that? You know, it's complicated. It's it's actually very helpful, but it's sometimes just hard to know when to do it. A lot of people lose track of when to do it. And but I think of it as very, very helpful. And I think of SSRIs specifically as a range of dose, right? And so you dose it, this is a little bit more than just a you, you clearly need to do this with under the supervision of a physician. Um, but you can kind of shift dosing around depending on need and prediction of what your need is going to be. Um, and it tends to be quite effective. So. Susan, do you find that you have to see patients more frequently before a cycle or during a cycle? Um, during a cycle. During a cycle. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of anticipatory anxiety when trying to conceive, but it's usually during the cycle where anxiety just, um, it becomes so elevated and sometimes really unbearable and understandably so. So having that added support ends up being really, really helpful. Again, because it can feel really isolating Maybe they don't have a community that they can necessarily go to. So to have that extra hour a week can make all of the difference. It just, again, a safe space to, yeah. to, to, to let it all out, right? To, to feel contained, to know that it's okay to be anxious. It's okay to be depressed. It's okay to feel devastated. Cause, and you use that word a lot, Kelly, and I'm glad that you're using it because that is what most of my clients feel when a cycle fails or when, when they get their period, trying to conceive naturally and they get their period it feels really devastating. Again, it's because they are having to, they are having to deal with the loss of this image that they've created in their minds of what this journey was going to look like, what their lives were going to look like. Um, so yeah. And, and I see my clients long-term as well. So I'm seeing clients from, you know, before partnership in partnership, trying to conceive, going through losses. Um, 
And I'm, and I'm so glad you guys are talking about medication to help again, reduce the stigma of it because it's, it can be such a wonderful support for so many clients, but there's so much fear surrounding it. And the reality is that it, in, it increases your risk, right. For, for, for PMDD, um, and other mood disorders. So I'm so glad that there's again, an open conversation that like there are medications that are safe and ask your doctor, talk to your doctor about it. Yeah. Well, I want to be mindful of your, your schedules. Cause I know there's there, you guys are busy. So, um, I want to wrap up, but I also want to kind of make sure if there's anything else parting words you want to, you know, talk about, I'm going to for sure have information about your practices and resources on the episode description, but any last words before we say goodbye? Josephine, thank you so much for having me on this. I was just like really happy to have this conversation with both you and Susan, because I think it's so important and we need to talk about it more. But I um, I just really appreciate the opportunity to be able to do this because I think it's so important. But it's funny for me, it's exactly the opposite. So when patients are going through a cycle and they're doing the injections, they feel empowered because they're doing something active but it's after um, ovulation when, you know, they're waiting to see, am I pregnant? Do I have a genetically normal embryo? That's when I see the heightened um, Mm. stress and anxiety. So it's exactly the opposite time from when you're seeing it. So it's just kind of interesting that we're seeing it at different times, but I think it's nice that you're supporting them during, and perhaps that's why they're like so happy during the cycle, but then I'm supporting them after. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And thank you. Just again, uh, just like Kelly said, I'm so happy that you asked me to be part of this. I've been wanting to talk to my colleagues more about this. Um, I sometimes do feel isolated in the field because there, I don't know very many therapists that are doing this work. And so I'm just so excited to have this conversation and hope there are many more to come. Right. Well, it also makes me think of the importance of just a collaborative team approach right. to, to approach someone's experience in anything, in mental health and medicine. And so I'm glad we all found a time for us to all be together to talk about this because we all do different things, but see the same people. Um, and so it's, it's, I was really looking forward to this conversation and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing this with a lot of my patients and just the, the listener hopefully can find this and you find this helpful. Great. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye. This has been Mind Stories. With remote appointments in California and nine offices throughout Southern California and the Bay Area, Cal Psychiatry specializes in medication management, mood and anxiety disorders, alternative therapies, women's mental health, and more to help you get back to your true self. Visit us at calpsychiatry.com. Thanks for listening to Mind Stories, and don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe.